Hello everyone, it is your host, Seth the Programmer. Today we're going to be talking about Kratos versus Thanos. Now, I hinted at this at the end of my Kratos power scale over a year ago because of the Infinity Gauntlet Easter Egg, also known as the Shattered Gauntlet of Ages that you could acquire in God of War 4. And ever since, I thought it'd be a fun matchup to watch play out anyway. In this video, we'll be going over God of War 4 Kratos versus Thanos from the Marvel Cinematic Universe, like Infinity War and Endgame, etc. And towards the end, we can even go over Prime Kratos vs. Comics Infinity Gauntlet Thanos, although this video will be mainly focused on the newer versions of the characters. That's more like a side bit, and it might even need its own video. To start things off, we'll go over Thanos first, since I've yet to really talk about him ever in a video. Thanos is a being who is able to outbox Prime Hulk while possibly using no Infinity Stones, destroy Thor near his Prime, who would later go on to tank the concentrated energy shot from a neutron star, and even acquired all of the Infinity Stones, with some of them on their own being enough to destroy the Nine Realms, as shown with the Reality Stone. Now, the Neutron Star feat from Thor isn't exactly in the star levels, as destroying a star and taking the amount of energy it, it can actually output every few seconds or so, it's totally two different things. And obviously the realms in the MCU are questionable, more like being planets in size, some even being flat as shown in Thor Ragnarok. Please do not debate Flat Earth in the comments. Uh, but with the full gauntlet, Thanos wipes out half of all sentient life in the universe. However, this in actuality is nothing compared to his actual plan in Endgame, where he planned to turn everything in the universe back to atoms and recreate it so that they wouldn't seek vengeance for his gift he was giving them like the last time. It's also kind of the Infinity Gauntlet's whole jip to give you absolute power over the universe it was made in, so why would it be a flex though? And the reason I say that is because I've seen some people say, well Thanos didn't do it therefore it didn't count, which is overall a pretty redundant statement. The whole point of Thanos saying that was because it was Thanos' actual plan and the plot of the movie, and it's not like Marvel wouldn't be willing to actually follow through with that, and in lore, the Infinity Gauntlet can take down universal entities in the comics and so on. There's just very little reason to deny the statement, but I understand some people like feats more than plot slash lore, but for this video, we will be using the fact that he was going to reduce everything to atoms. Unfortunately, in the MCU, there aren't many speed feats in terms of combat, which is understandable due to the limitations of cinema. However, Thanos does have a feat where he rips the surface off of Titan's moon and throws it at the Avengers, with some of the meteors arriving from the moon to the planet in as little as three seconds. Using Roche limits or normal standards for moons, you can get this from massively hypersonic to relativistic to light, depending on how much you want to highball or downplay it. As a note, it takes light only 1.2 seconds to go from our moon to Earth, so it's really impossible to say the feat is light speed. I've seen arguments trying to scale Thanos to Hela, Loki, and Ragnarok Thor, in which Hela entered the Bifrost after Loki and Thor to engage in a bit of scuffle with them, and could even throw attacks that outpace the move into the Bifrost that was transporting Loki and Thor at, and the Bifrost being able to transport things in quick succession over many light years. The only problem with this is that it's a bit of a strange argument, it's almost like saying that if you were to fight someone in a rocket ship that you'd be as fast as the rocket ship. And of course, due to some laws of motion, if you were to throw a baseball after stabilizing in the rocket ship, would you be throwing a baseball faster than a rocket ship in your base speed if you weren't on a rocket ship? And the argument just doesn't really stack up very well, unfortunately. It would work better, maybe, if Thor and Loki were reacting to, like, maybe stagnant objects that were, like, lodged in the Bifrost and weren't moving or something, but it just doesn't work outside of that. Now, we'll go over some of Thanos' more special abilities, or hacks, after I go over Kratos, since that's what we'll be mainly duking them out with. But for now, that's generally what's acceptable for Thanos and in the MCU. I might go over a few more AP arguments later on. Now, we'll move on to Kratos, and one of the more important things to go over for Kratos before anything else, I'd bring up what constitutes valid Word of God statements to preempt anyone who makes that question. This is a Facebook conversation here with Stig Ostmussen, who was the creative director of God of War 3 and the art director of God of War 2 prior to that. In this conversation, Stig says that the writers, concept artists, and senior level staff in general all contribute equally to the story, so they're all valid sources. Every question slash answer presented here was asked to a developer of the caliber that Stig describes, so every dev answer posted here has been from a valid source. 
We can use this to further establish what level of evidence is required to build an accurate scale for Kratos later, and to clear up his more vague and less established lore points that they can only really answer. Another prima facie for Kratos is to go over what is and isn't canon to determine what we can use for him against Thanos. We have director slash writer confirmation that so long as material doesn't contradict the game's stories or how they have things set up inside of said game world, that the material is generally acceptable for the lore. Longtime writer of the series since the beginning, Ariel Lawrence, and the creative director of God of War 3, once again, Stig, agree on this. So whatever doesn't directly contradict the game's story or presentation of info is valid. Some examples of this being where the God of War novel doesn't show how Kratos getting the souls of Hades' magic, where the novel said Aphrodite was born from Uranus going balls deep in the ocean, and so forth. So we'll be using some of these resources, most importantly the new God of War 4 novel written by Cory Barlog's father with assistant and oversight from Cory himself. And now that we have went over that, we can go over just exactly how strong Kratos in 4 is. We know for a fact that Kratos at least can take blows and face off against Baldur like in their Man of Steel showdown at the very start of the game, even when he got more serious after losing his immortality curse put on him by the goddess Freya, Kratos and Atreus were still able to put him down. This is interesting because even when Baldur was immortal and didn't even try his absolute hardest in many of his confrontations trying to die, he was still able to put the World Serpent down in only a few surprise blows. The World Serpent, Jormungandr, has actually faced off against Thor twice, and in their first encounter, first being in quotations here because of convolution and time, they clashed and splintered the world tree, the Yggdrasil. Splintered usually means to break or cause to break into small sharp fragments, and if you search on Google Images for splintered trees, it usually comes up with something a little like this. The reason this is so impressive is because in the words of the goddess Freya, the Yggdrasil is a tree that holds all of creation and that every single strand of it transcends time and space. This includes the nine realms, which are their own universes slash dimensions with their own time and space slash cosmoses. In the God of War 4 novel, it is described that a single branch of the Yggdrasil stretches on for infinity, and that was liked by Cory Barlog later on when it was asked if it was literal or not on Twitter. Now how exactly the realm scale to the Yggdrasil is up for debate, such as the Yggdrasil mural that displays the realms on it being too vague to determine if it's to scale or not. Though it's worth reiterating that it was said that the realms are contained along its branches and bows, even though its strands alone are above time and space. Regardless, the Yggdrasil itself should encompass infinity, and every single one of its infinite strands transcend time and space. Thor and the World Serpent then splintered the entire thing with their battle. There's also Surtur and Ymir to scale with as well. Back in the day, Ymir was stabbed and killed by Odin, and the battle they had, or whatever confrontation they had, is unknown, but Ymir bled so much that his blood flooded all of creation. The tide was even described as endless by Mimir. Surtur's heat also spawned all of the stars, and that he is the one who brought all heat to the cosmos. Thor and Odin also battle Surtur and land a mortal blow on him, but in his dying state destroys everything meaning Thor could battle a being who could end all of existence, including the Yggdrasil and the realm between realms, which is an even larger infinity engulfing the Yggdrasil. Yet stalemated the world serpent who Baldur could harm. Usually when people hear this, they like to downplay God of War by saying things like, the story isn't supposed to be literal and blah blah blah, and this is not at all how the authors of the series view these things, it's really just kind of downplaying fans that see these things, not the actual writers. The writers tend to agree that it's literal. God of War is supposed to be a literal representation of these human myths that we have. Matt Sophos, the lead writer of God of War 4, has answered questions about this matter and states that while man's history marches along linearly, all of its myths and interpretations are equally valid. But I think I'd rather have Cory Barlog, the creative director of God of War 2 and 4, explain it himself. So is this a continuation of the Kratos we've already played as, or is this a new incarnation? Are you talking about that yet? Continuation. Okay. Uh, so it is like, the way I, I kind of see the, uh, the mythologies is kind of like that uh, Hubble telescope image mm. of all of the galaxies. The right? ultra-deep field. Yeah. yeah. So that image 
shows the universe with all of its individual galaxies. Each galaxy is kind of like uh, a representation of a mythology, mm. you know, and sort of wrap that around the Earth. And at any given moment, all of these mythological belief systems uh, existed. You know, they all deal with a creation myth around their region. It's just separated by geography. Mm. So that while the height of some of these mythological beliefs are at different time periods, uh, a lot of them kind of align with a, a single point mm. in time. Uh, now, in terms of speed, Kratos in 4, while out of shape, should still be quantifiably similar in speed to God of War 3 Kratos. And even without that, he scales to the Valkyries who can fly between realms with just sheer movement speed. These realms are stretched along the infinite Yggdrasil, with every strand surpassing time and space again, in which time moves differently as well in all realms, such as how time passes extremely slowly in Helheim compared to Midgard. If you use God of War 3 scaling, Kratos should scale to Hermes, who transports all souls to the underworld, delivers all dreams to people sleeping, and can canonically dodge the light of Helios' head point blank. The light of Helios is the same light that would be able to light up the entire underworld, which is described as infinite and immeasurable on several occasions, and even having its own visible sea of stars in its backgrounds in many challenge arenas. One of the Sisters of Fate in the God of War 2 novel also sent out a mental projection of herself that was described as having infinite speed. This was done very casually on her part, and Kratos was able to outright fight two Sisters of Fate at the same time, including the one who did this feat. You can also take the scaling back even further to God of War Ascension, which takes place mere months after Kratos accidentally killed his first wife and daughter, let alone his new God of War 4. Kratos was at his absolute weakest here by game chronology, and yet he scales above the warriors of Zeus who can temporarily dash at light speeds. Taking it further, Ascension Kratos even scales above the time-manipulating conjoined twins Pollux and Castor, who themselves scale above the warriors of Zeus. Now, Kratos was a bit mouthier than Thanos' part, but obviously there's a few more complications to go over than Thanos. Thanos is pretty blatant. You watch the two movies, you pretty much know everything about him. Kratos, you got some novels, you have to talk to the authors. He's got a lot more to take in, so... With all their stats out of the way now, we can go over exactly what would happen if Kratos and Thanos did have to fight. Now, for one, there's a blatant speed issue for Thanos. Thanos, even if you highballed his movie feats, would be hitting relativistic speeds unless you took the Hella scuffle completely out of context. Whereas Kratos has numerous statements and encounters against beings that require infinite speed and lore, even downplaying these encounters to light speed, such as Zeus's warriors using the essence of Hyperion the Valkyries traveling between universes, or Helios' light only being light speed, which it's not, would put Kratos' absolute low end a massive portion above Thanos' higher bald scaling. There's also the issue of power. While Thanos with the gauntlet can turn everything in the universe into atoms, Kratos has to deal with beings that are going to end the existence of numerous higher infinities, usually casually, such as Searcher going to erase all of existence on his deathbed, Ymir's guts spilling out of his body, being able to flood all of creation, and so forth. There's simply not enough to go off of for Thanos, especially considering that Thanos was only going to reduce everything in the universe to atoms, rather than destroy the actual universe and its space-time. So even if you wanked Thanos and just said he was going to destroy the whole universe itself, not just everything in it, it still wouldn't be enough to actually deal with Kratos remotely, let alone the fact that Kratos could easily blitz and rip Thanos' head or arm clean off before Thanos could even blink in theory. Some at this point would get pretty desperate and try to scale Thanos to MCU Dormammu, who is a being with infinite power in the MCU guidebooks that plans to fuse all universes and dimensions into his dark dimension by saying that Thanos is the strongest being in the universe. However, even if this was granted, in the universe would not include Dormammu, who exists outside of the universe Infinity War took place in. Even if you scaled Thanos to Dormammu, Kratos would still have better feats than MCU Dormammu, as well as hacks that vastly outshine MCU Thanos, who show nothing even remotely as effective as his comic counterpart. The only real grantable thing to Thanos is that he possibly has better resistance to time loops like what Doctor Strange did, however that's not really a strength feat, it's more so a hacks resistance that Dormammu doesn't have. It should also be noted that Dormammu was casually obliterating Doctor Strange for like thousands of times over while him and Thanos kind of had a pitched battle. When it comes to hacks, 
There's not really a hack Thanos has that could work either. Even if Kratos was cocky and let Thanos try something, we know that Kratos is immune to time stops and manipulation, that he fights numerous opponents that can rip souls out of bodies and manipulate them, and he has resistance to even transmutation, such as when he's able to return from his entire body, insides included, turning to stone, as well as mental resistances, such as when he fights numerous sirens that can cast illusions on men. And that's not even to go over his more detailed hacks, which would mainly be from 3, but in this case he doesn't even really need most of his hacks. It should also be noted that with the power of hope, that Kratos kept a tiny portion of deep down after the events of 3, as stated by Cory on the kinda funny Gamecast special God of War spoiler cast, which can actually damage and destroy concepts themselves, such as the concept of fear at the end of 3. All in all, it's a stomp, and no, Thanos with his Dark Souls Twin Blade isn't really doing any better. That version of Thanos was mainly tangling with many out of shape Avengers and some of the newer cast, but overall didn't show any new feats to use against Kratos that actually really changed the result. If anything, it would make it harder because the best thing Thanos has going for him is hacks. Now, if we used Prime Kratos, Prime God of War 3 Kratos, all his equipment, and comic Thanos, the battle is far more pitched far more haxes and hax resistances, you have the amped death Thanos, Thanos is going to have good feats against powerful M bodies such as eternity and death and so forth, but unfortunately that would easily double if not triple the length of this video which is already too long as it is, so if you guys are interested we can go full balls to the wall with Kratos' best hacks and showings against comics infinity gauntlet Thanos, so just let me know. And other than that, I hope you guys enjoyed. Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell if you want a sequel, and till next time.